So, um, thank you very much for uh, letting me talk in this great venue. I, this is my first time at the ICTP, but I, I've heard this, uh, this place since I started my studies in physics. And to be honest, it's a great honor to speak in this, uh, in this place and to this audience, especially in times where ignorance tends to divide us and take people apart, a place that puts knowledge to unite humanity is a great, uh, it's a great achievement. It's a great honor for me to be here. So um, today I would like to talk about uh, something that we've been doing in Vienna for the past few years. And the idea is to try to learn um, from nature how to control the structure of a polymer chain and control the structure to the point that you can even force it to and self-entangle itself to a very given structure uh, and to a given knotted structure in particular, um, uh, like the picture you see uh, in this, uh, on the first slide. Um, so basically, the first thing I have to do is to acknowledge the team, uh, which we are working together in Vienna, and we are working on, and I will show you different aspect of this problem, because to reach this stage, we will need to approach it from very different angles. And so I will uh, try to guide you through this, um, to this uh, approach that we follow there. So the first thing I would like to, oh, okay. The first thing I would like to mention a little bit is uh, my grain of salt why it might be interesting to study knots altogether. Apart from the fact that we have seen so many beautiful examples all day long of the fact that we actually can, which is good enough reason to do it, but there are also certain type of applications that might profit a lot from an understanding of how to control the topological properties of uh, matter. And there is one particular application that I'm, part, uh, that I'm interested in that is related to drug delivery and the possibility to convert and control the stability of biomolecules by controlling their topological states. So, for instance, this little example here is this, uh, it's the venom from this uh, sea uh, uh, animal that is actually used as a painkiller, it's very effective, but in its state, if you would ingest it, it would be completely destroyed by your gastrointestinal uh, uh, equipment. But if you just cross-link it, so you effectively topologically close this little protein, you can then safely inject it. It will have exactly the same function and, and efficacy. So this is just a little example to show you that, in fact, when you, when you are affect and you can control the architecture of matter, in particular, polymeric chain, you can affect a lot of the structural properties and stability. So there are many applications both in the biological world, drug delivery, and in material science. So what I would like to show you today is the question of how can you design a chain to do what is doing in this, chain, in this movie to reliably fold into a very specified knot that you want a priori given, okay? So in other words, we want to ask a question that is across the domains of polymer physics and proteins in particular. This is the research, a little outline of the research we conduct in Vienna. And what we learn from polymers is that uh, we have seen there are many, a lot of is known about the nothing probabilities of polymers. But we also know that proteins are the part, one of the best examples in nature of a system where you can control to a very high precision a target structure that is given, the fact that proteins fall. So basically the idea is try to learn from, from this system and then apply here to be able to control the structure and then the knotting properties. And so this brings us to the idea, I would like to give you a certain a little set of definitions. First of all, what we mean by design. So design is the process that you have to apply in order to search a sequence of letters. In this case, in the case of a protein would be a sequence of amino acid. In the case of a polymer would be the sequence of chemical residue that you use to create your chain that will self-reliably fold into maybe not an exactly unique structure, but at least a very small amount of uh, configurations that are 
given by your target in the pro design process. I will define designable a system that has at least one solution to this problem, okay? Um, so, in principle, the big task in this process is that if you would like to explore and test whether a system is designable or not, it would require you to, first of all, take your chain, tr try to construct a sequence that you think should fold in the target structure, and then test it to see if it works on. If it doesn't work, you would have to change it and go on for this process. If for even small systems, this, this algorithm is incredibly complex, it will take forever. So we have to uh, learn somehow from a system that already does this process of converting a one-dimensional information, a sequence, into a three-dimensional information. So protein do it. And so the first question that sort of pops to mind then is, uh, what makes proteins designable? Which is slightly different than asking the question how protein folds, which is one of the big biophysical questions. But this one is a slightly different question because uh, it's basically trying to understand what is it that allows this uh, conversion of information. And the, the ingredients that we are, I just want to uh, highlight here is the fact that proteins are polymers made of more or less 20 different types of chemical units, the amino acid, and they are connected into a chain and one certain, a subset of sequences of amino acid is capable to reliably folding to very uh, precise uh, configuration, as we also, also seen in previous talks. So what I would like to show you uh, briefly before we actually go in the business of designing knots is that key to our answer this question is are in the geometrical properties of the protein backbone. So in particular, I, I would like to show you that the fact that the backbone of proteins has the hydrogen bonds uh, that create the network that energetically stabilizes the secondary structure, helices and beta sheet, is key to allow this com information, uh, uh, conversion of information. And in particular, if you make a model that takes that into account properly, you can actually construct sequences that reliably fold with high precision to real protein structure. And I don't think I will have time to show you that, but if you're interested, I will go into detail. And in fact, the, the fact that if you actually then take the same model and you apply it to real protein sequences, they fold back again to the same precision to the native structure. So what I, I'm trying to say is that by trying to answer this question and find fundamental principle of protein designability, we actually constructed a pretty quantitative protein model in terms of protein designability and protein folding. But the advantage of this process was that it allowed us to identify key elements of, that can be transferred to the artificial system. And this is the uh, biomimetic system I will present today. The idea is that what we learn from proteins is that the hydrogen bond network is essential element to produce this, allow for this information conversion, and we copy that into a simple bit spring model where each bit is decorated by directional interaction patches, which are actually in soft matter, patchy particle are now highly popular because they, in fact, are used to control a lot of the configurational space of colloidal uh, systems. But if you connect them into a string, the patches now will have the same job as the hydrogen bonds. And I will show you that this is enough to actually create designable strings of not the patchy polymers with a high, very high precision on the target structure. So um, again, so now I want to talk about first about artificial proteins first very briefly because this is where we started and it tells you how in a way you can construct a system that self fold into a given structure. So the approach we are going to follow is uh, very quickly on a multi-scale idea. So we're going to learn uh, how to design simple systems lattice proteins that have been mentioned before, like the HP model, but with more than two letters. We're going to use an alphabet of 20 letters initially. And then we're going to move what we learn to try to design off lattice. And maybe uh, the idea of this approach is that we can, the information that we learn here can also be used to understand what happens to a much more detailed system. But I will not talk about that today. So uh, the first step to understand the most simple way to understand protein design is to use a very uh, old model called the 
random energy model that was developed in the 1980s by Derrida and was applied successfully to understand the, pro the thermodynamics of protein folding in, in the late 80s, beginning of the 90s, by several uh, very famous scientists from Peter Wallinus, Eugene Shaknovich, um, Gutin, Pande, Grossberg. I mean, there is a huge list of people that applied origin in the 80s and 90s to this model to explain uh, protein folding. The idea is quite simple uh, in, a, in a pinch, in a very brief information. The idea is that if you want to construct a sequence of amino acids that folds into a structure, what you have to do is to simply minimize the energy of that sequence into the target structure that you have. And the reason for why this is possible is because this energy, if it's lower than this point here, it will allow you to basically reach that configuration before you are trapped in what it, these are called the glass state of the system. So the system, it, before it gets dynamically arrested, so frozen, can actually reach this native state. This is in a very quick uh, explanation. And the complex expression I showed you before to describe this point can be translated into a very simple physical idea. That this process is possible if the entropy associated to the information that you put in your system, so in other words, your alphabet, so you have 20 letters, and these 20 letters define how much information you can put in a discrete string of, let's say, 50 amino acids, is larger than the configurational entropy of your polymer. This is, for instance, why it's hard to design something with just two letters, like the HP model, but if you use three, four, five letters, then it's much, much simpler. So this is basically the prediction of the theory. If a system, a system to be designable, you have to at least satisfy this condition. So what we, uh, what we did, of course, uh, if a system is designable, then the design principle is quite easy. What you do is you define a target structure. So if this is the energy of your, of your protein, you, you can split the contribution in two, in two contribution. Well, if I and J are two amino acid pairs, then Cij here indicates it's a matrix that tells you if amino acid I and amino acid J are interacting. And Sij is another matrix that tells you what type of interaction there is between I and J. So this is a matrix that tells you in which configuration you are because it's a spatial connection between the object, while Sij tells you uh, what is the nature of the chemical interaction. So this is basically the sequence and this is the configuration part of your interaction. Uh, so design means that you fix C by giving a target structure and you explore the sequence space to minimize the energy. While folding is the other way around, you, uh, you have a sequence that you designed before and then you minimize basically the, uh, look for the global energy minimum of your energy and in principle this should two lines should converge to the same point if you have a protein fold into a single target structure, okay? Now, on lattice protein, this is quite simple to do, has been done extensively, and it works quite well most of the time. But the problem is that if you now, instead of putting a lattice protein as your target, you, start, you put a different kind of protein model, like a realistic protein model, or let's say a string of particles, even with degraded with patches, this process doesn't work anymore as easily as you might think. And the reason is because if you don't have the proper representation of the protein, the actual degrees of freedom of your chain, so if you want the configurational entropy of your chain, of your polymer, becomes so large that this minimization process fails. Okay, so basically, what happens is that your omega becomes so much larger that with 20 letters, it doesn't work anymore. One solution could be to increase the number of letters that you use. For instance, this is equivalent to use this, uh, the uh, native energy term in the Hamiltonian, which is basically, uh, uh, which was mentioned in the talk before. The idea is that you include information about your target configuration for the folding. This is effectively like bringing your alphabet to a much larger size because you're saying that amino acid I can only interact with amino acid J and not with the other. So effectively, it's like bringing your alphabet from 20 letters to N letters. So this is why you recover your folding. But the other way to do it is to actually try to represent your protein, uh, including the correct set of interactions, such that omega is correctly smaller 
than Q so that with 20 layers this process works again. So we did that uh, uh, in this model that I don't want to talk about too much because this is not the scope of this talk, but it's just, I want to mention it because it's the reference for our biomimetic system. And the idea was to just take uh, a protein backbone without the side chain, so each amino acid is represented by this large sphere here, so it's a very simple representation, but you have 20 different spheres representing a different amino acid and you have an interaction matrix that gives you the chemical flavor of each different interaction. And the idea was that instead of trying to parameterize the model to make this object reproduce the folding property of, uh, of a specific protein, we wanted to reproduce the designability of the model. So our idea was to fine tune the parameters until the omega was smaller than Q, so we could actually design this system to fold uh, real protein structure. So we parameterize in this way, if you have, if you're curious about it, I will be happy to show you more details about how the model works, but I just want to show you the, the main result, the fact that it works on the design part. So if we take a series of protein structures, here there are just four examples, direct straight from the protein data bank, you completely strip the sequence information. Now this is just the position of atoms in space, but each amino acid now we reconstruct it from scratch using the same design procedure that works on lattice protein and it's that random, the random energy model explained us why it should work. Then you produce an artificial sequence that might even not be uh, a real protein sequence at this stage, but it refolds to the target structure with remarkable precision considering how simple the model is. So in other words, these, uh, these, these results indicated at least our model respects the concept of designability defined in the random energy model. And it's also nice because it gives you a link between the very simple lattice models all the way to off lattice and realistic protein structures, okay? So, um, again, now we want to learn from the protein side of, and go back to the material science and try to ex extract this principle and bring it to a completely artificial system that doesn't anymore uh, remember anything of the biological part except on the fact that we learned from proteins how to design a heterogeneous polymer. And so these are these, uh, what we call the bionic proteins. And what we did with it was to represent basically still keep an, uh, an isotropic interaction as uh, mimicking uh, our alphabet of letters with particles with different chemical uh, properties. And we decorated now every particle with this directional interaction that are reminiscent of the hydrogen bonds network on the protein backbone. And so this is an example of the interactions we used. Uh, in principle, this is just one set of interaction, but uh, one can think about many others. And, uh, I will mention a few others as a matter of fact. So the interactions between the center of the sphere is given by this simple sigmoidal function, which is basically a, represented, a continuous version of a square well potential. And the depth of the well gives you the different type of interactions between the different type of uh, uh, particle you use, while the interactions between the patches is the same as we used for the hydrogen bond uh, network in the proteins. So it's a Leonard Jones 1012 very sharp. Uh, of course, we can also control the range of it, but uh, we started with the same interaction as in the proteins. And the Leonard Jones is modulated by uh, this function of these two angles. So basically, this function, this uh, potential is at the minimum when the two patches look at each other, and when, while when they are orthogonal, this potential is zero, okay? So, uh, Immediately, you can actually spot a similarity to what Mark showed this morning on the di dipole, uh, uh, the Stockmeyer fluid. The idea is that you have an a, a isotropic interaction that will compete with the directional interaction in terms of packing and configurational of, uh, configuration of the system. And you, so we can actually change the, the relative strength between these two interactions and the range of the relative range. And so to give a parallel to what I was saying before, basically, if you have the hydrogen bonds, you, you basically restrict this configurational space enough to allow designability. For the patches, it's the same thing. 
if you don't have patches, you are basically like a simple uh, self-avoiding walk polymer, so you cannot design it, but if you add the patches, you restrict the configurational space to the point that you have designability again. But again, in the other limit, you would expect that if you put too many patches on the system, again, uh, you go back to the uh, isotropic uh, particle with no patches whatsoever. So there will be a region in the number of patches and geometry where the system is designable. So the other thing, uh, so the first thing we did was to uh, try out what happens when you change the parameters. So for instance, if you take the situation where you have one patch per particles and you increase the uh, interaction range between the particle from basically very short range to long range, you get that the system first just is happy uh, in this configuration and then suddenly wants to pack more and more. And here you start to see that you have these wrapping configurations, which is exactly the same as Mark observed in, this, uh, in the dipolar sphere system. And in fact, this one will be what I will show you later are precursor of many knotted configuration that we, you can design uh, specifically. Or if you have two patches instead per particle, you have a different configurational space, and these are the typical configuration the system will adopt. So uh, the first thing we have to do now is to define the designability of the system. This is what I mentioned before. How do we say which patch configuration and range is uh, designable from one that is not designable. Because in principle, what we have to do is to define if there is at least one solution to the design problem. So what we did was to make a large-scale simulation where we change both at the same time the configuration of, uh, 50, uh, uh, of a polymer of length 50 and also its sequence. Okay, so we basically explored at the same time the sequence and the configuration on space. And we projected over these two order parameter, the probability of observing uh, the configuration in the system. So Q is the number of contacts between the isotropic interactions, so it tells you how compact the object is, and QH is the number of patch-patch interaction. So it, what you see is that there is a region here, the dark region, that is much more probable than the rest. What this tells you is that not only that there are more configurations that have this pair of values, but it's also that there are more sequences that like to be in that region. So this means that these configurations that are in, in, the, uh, in the low, in the free energy minimum, are also the most designable one. So these tools is able to, uh, it's a tool to compare how different systems are designable, uh, sorry, different configurations are designable, but it's also a way to identify, in principle, the most designable a configuration in a given geometry of patches, and interaction range, and etc. So once you have this configuration, then you can test if it's indeed possible to design it and make it fold to a very specific configuration. And if it's not, then you know that this particular set of interactions that you choose are not designable. So you can build up a phase space of it. So the first step is to test if, for instance, this object folds or not, is designable and it folds. So you select the configuration that is here, and this is the case. And since I will, like, I will show you uh, several of these plots, it's useful to uh, just give it a metaphor. We call this uh, the Sauron plot because it gives this uh, very sharp, long, uh, dark area. So this is basically the eye of Sauron that you, maybe some of you have seen in the Lord of the Rings. So. Um, so if you take the, one, the configuration I showed you before and you design it as the same way as I showed you for the proteins and for the lattice protein before, you can construct a sequence of amino acids. Here we used uh, 20 amino acids that will basically fold exactly to the target configuration. So this free energy landscape here is a projection of all the configuration of the polymer over this collective variable called the DRMSD, which is a measure of the distance with respect to the target configuration. So zero means that your, config your instantaneous configuration is exactly equal to the target. Larger the number, more differences there are. So basically, if the global mean free energy minimum is so close to zero, it means that the system predominantly wants to be exactly in the folded configuration. And in fact, uh, you can actually use this system to 
even create very precise patterning. So for uh, uh, material science, this would be very useful because we have a preci controlled precision over the structure, which is basically uh, about 10% of the particle size. And this is something that basically is close to the precision of, that proteins have and is the kind of precision you would need to achieve, for instance, uh, catalytic reaction, ca uh, control over catalytic reaction, or structural control if you want to use as building blocks for hierarchical self-assembly. So, as I said, with the designability measure that I gave you before, then we can compare different, how designable different geometry of patches and different alphabet are. So in this way, we can actually construct a map of uh, how different patchy polymers are designable compared to the others. And basically, what, what we found out is that uh, without patches, no system is designable, no, ma no matter, even if you use 20 letters. As soon as you start to increase the number of patches, you with high number of uh, a larger alphabet, you start to have designable systems. And then, basically, you have a nice sweet spot between three and uh, at least 10 patches per particle where uh, between three and 20 letters, you can easily design your target configuration to reliably fall to the target structure with the precision I showed you before. And as I said also, if you increase too much the number of patches, then this ability, this ability is gonna go down again because effectively what's going on is that omega, so the, ent the configurational entropy of your chain is gonna start again to increase. And another way to since it's the problem to, to do this analysis is that it's very, very difficult to compute omega. So in principle, to repeat this approach to a different, uh, for a different model or a different system, you would have to redo this entire procedure of designability and folding, etc. So we came up, uh, basically we wanted to give a quantification of this omega that we could basically transfer to a different system. So what it turns out, uh, that the best way to actually measure how the, conf the configurational space of the polymer was restricted was by looking at the radius of the radial distribution function between the particles along the chain, so the, the G of R. What happens is that when the system starts to have more and more um, effect of the patches, not more and more patch interactions, because in all the structure I showed you before, all the patches were fully, were fully bonded, okay? But the patches will start to have an effect over the random packing that you get when you just have a chain of attractive sphere that collapse into a random globule. When you have patches, this creates a perturbation in the geometry of the random packing because also the patches wants to be satisfied. And this, since they have such a directional geometry like the the hydrogen bonds in the protein, this creates uh, the uh, disruption of the simple uh, 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 random packing and a peak arises exactly in correspondence of the distance, the bond-bond distance between the patches. When this peak becomes dominant in the G of R distribution, then the system is designable. So this is a measure that is independent of our model because this is basically what we are saying is that if you have somehow a way to restrict the configurational space with some sort of interaction perturbing the normal random packing of your polymer, then your system is a very good candidate for being designable. As a matter of fact, in fact, uh, not only this is true for the patchy polymer, but if you go back in proteins and you look at the G of R of between the C alpha atoms, you get exactly the same kind of peaks that are completely due to the uh, hydrogen bonds interaction. And these dominate the G of R distribution. And of course, we are also trying to apply this to different uh, other protein models or other systems that have been uh, candidates for designability. For instance, the tube model developed by uh, Maritan, Banavar, Micheletti, etc. I mean, there are many people involved in the tube model. It's a very well-known model. And this could be another place to test, for instance, this criteria. But there are several other examples. And in fact, I would like to call upon Mark if he wants to collaborate on testing this principle on the Stockmeyer uh, uh, system to see if, in fact, the dipoles themselves are capable of restricting the, the directional space exactly as our patch interaction do. So, and now we go to the core part of uh, what I promised, how to design 
uh, knots. So as I said, we have a tool now to analyze uh, how a given system and to categorize how desirable different configurations are. But the problem of the analysis I showed you before is that it requires quite heavy free energy calculations because you have to sample the configurational space of the chain quite heavily. And we rely on bias techniques that need to have a good order parameter to uh, help the system to sample around. So in principle, one could think that the simplest approach would be to use uh, one of the many algorithms developed to analyze the, uh, the, the topological properties of your chain to assess if you have a knot or not and what type of knot you have. But the thing is that most of these methods are, even if they are very efficient, they are too heavy to be used at every single Monte Carlo step where you would have to assess the topological state of your chain and use that to bias your simulation, okay? But instead, what we did was to implement a method based on the average crossing number, which, of course, doesn't give you exactly the definition of the topological state of the chain, but what, what it was found is that it correlates a lot with the complexity of the knot. So higher is the average crossing number, higher is going to be the complexity of your knot. It doesn't guarantee you that you will have a knot, but at least it will, at least will force the system to explore more and more complex uh, uh, places. And so this is the, basically the plot that you get if you do the simulation of one of the systems I showed you before, and you force it to explore uh, different uh, chains with different average crossing number and different end-to-end -end distance. So this is still preliminary results. We are studying a lot of it. And so it, we are actually curious about if this uh, jumping has any meaning and what, where, what kind of knots we get in this landscape. We still, this is a, a quite an unknown landscape to us in terms of what configuration we get because we still have to analyze a lot of this data. This is a thousands and thousands of configurations. But if you zoom in close to the global minimum, you get what we refer, what we can expect to be the most designable knot for that particular uh, geometry of the chain. And then you can, uh, in fact, place back this knot in the Sauron plot, and you find out that, in fact, this one corresponds also close to the global minimum that, as we know, are the most designable configurations of this particular system. So in, we expect these systems, this approach, to actually be able to sample knots and categorize them afterwards to how designable they are. And uh, uh, it will give us also a way to explore different uh, good target, good knots to be designed also for applications. So for instance, if you use uh, three patches and three letters, you get the knots that I showed you before. So this, the example I showed you was just using uh, sorry, here I made a mistake. This is, you have to subtract two. So this is one patch, one patch, two patches, not three and four. I made a small mistake here. And here we use just an alphabet of three letters. And here, 20 letters, you get this very interesting uh, self-wrapping uh, systems. And here you use, uh, again, three and 20. And here the knot is a bit more difficult to see, but basically I try to highlight it by having the color coding that follows the index of the chain. So it's basically, this is one end and this is the other end of the chain and goes through. So these are knotted and the knot, the exact knot as we, has been evaluated by Luca Tubiana using the method that he developed to, uh, um, analyze the topological state, and I think Christian mentioned that today on um, the method of using to uh, minimally frustrating distance to, of the convex hull of the knot. Uh, um, so basically, <clears throat> okay. So now I want to show you uh, an application of a knotted chain that is related to what I was mentioning in the beginning. So with this technology, we can this design in principle chains to self-fold into a given knotted structure and to control the position of the particle to the precision that we can uh, predict exactly in space where the two ends of the chain will be, okay? So now imagine that you can construct this object in the lab and it will self-fold into this structure. 
okay? As, as it's given here. Uh, I call this temperature, but you should, should just consider this as a sort of the physical, physiological condition where this chain falls naturally to the target configuration and reaches this state. Now imagine that you lock the two ends by cross-linking, by creating a cross-link reaction that would topologically freeze the chain. Okay, so now the knot cannot be undone unless you actually cut the chain itself. What happens is that basically what we saw is if you now increase the temperature, or in other words, you bring your chain very far away from the physiological condition where normally it would fold, the structure remains almost completely intact. It stays there. Because this is a highly localized knot, it's very well packed, and even if you basically switch off the interactions between the particles, it stays there because you created a topological entanglement that cannot be unbroken. So this means that this object then can, can be used in completely different conditions than the one you constructed in the first place. And just to mention that all I'm saying is not completely out of another planet, we are actually working in Vienna with a group of Peter van Ostrom and Eric Reimold to actually construct this chain of particles because Another advantage of this system is that, in fact, you can both uh, construct it on the micron scale and the nanometer scale, just depending on how you represent this particle in the lab. And if you do it on the micron scale, you actually can see it in, under the microscope, which is a huge advantage to follow in the experiments what happens to the system. So as a biomimetic system, this would be very interesting to see how it folds because it will also give a lot of information on how folding takes place uh, on, on a simple polymer when you can look it up directly on an optical microscope. So um, I'm going to finish now acknowledging all the people that I collaborated with, uh, in particular uh, the people I work with in, in Vienna and all the other people will collaborate, in particular, Peter van Ostrom, Silvia Lecia, and Rick Reimold, who are doing the experiment I showed you before. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>